It's such a blessing to be together with each other. I am so thankful that we have the, the Holy Sabbath day to connect with one another, to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And just by listening to the hymns and thinking about all the things that are taking place around the world, I am so thankful that we have been given the opportunity to know of the gospel, to know of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Before we begin with the message for today, I would kindly invite you to join me once more for a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to have you in our lives. We are so thankful to be able to be called Christians, to carry the name of Christ, Father. And I just want to pray for the message that we're going to be going through this morning. I pray and ask that you guide my mind in particular, that I can articulate your thoughts and not my own thoughts that we can learn of this experience and that it can bring us closer to Jesus because that is what we want. We know and we ought to keep it constantly before our eyes that by beholding we become changed. We want to be changed in the image of Christ and we want to behold Christ because that is the only way to get there. I want to pray for every person that is here with us today. We thank you for all that you have done for us, Father. And we pray and ask all of this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, over the past few messages, we've been doing a little bit of a journey. Um, more, more particularly, a journey within Adventist history. Uh, all the way back, three messages ago, we talked about the definition of what Seventh-day Adventism is really all about. And last time we were together, we discussed the subject was entitled Adventism before and after and we looked at a particular event that took place in Ad, within Adventist history and studying history should be on our on everybody's list of things to do not only these last days but generally speaking and if you think about it let's consider the Bible for a moment isn't the Bible a book that is filled with so much history when you go through Genesis through the Revelation, there's so much history in the Word of God. So the Word of God in and of itself stimulates us to be interested in history. But not only that, I think that if we notice, even coming outside of the spiritual world, when we look at the world at large, um, we are to benefit from studying our history because those that do not study their history, they tend to repeat it. So God wants us to study history. God wants us to study history in the world. God wants us to study the history found in the Bible, the Bible in general. God wants us to also study the history of the church. Isn't the book of Revelation speaking about uh, the, different, uh, uh, the different ages that the church is going to go through, the different um, churches, seven churches that describe the life of the church in general, all the way back to the apostles coming to the end of time? It is. We see this idea of history constantly before us everywhere we turn in the Word of God. And this is why we have been doing this short series on this particular uh, event within Adventist history. Now, last, last time we worked together, we discussed particularly what happened within the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the year 1950. And our focus was on the printing, publishing of this book that you see uh, before you. And we talked a little bit about the different ideas that were put out by this book and how this book came about. Uh, there were these meetings that took place between Adventists and Evangelicals and the particular Evangelicals that were part of, that, of those meetings, they labeled Seventh-day Adventism as a cult because they did not agree with certain portions of the theology that comes from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We talked about uh, the understanding of God and Christ, or Christ in particular, His pre-existence. The other questions that were raised were, were those with respect to the investigative judgment, the atonement, uh, the human nature of Christ, salvation, sin, etc. These were all of the various questions that the evangelicals were opposing up until the time when they met with those particular leaders within the Adventist Church. And you see a picture here of Leroy Froome, who was an active, very active in the putting together in, in this book. And we study these things because they are important. We ought to understand what has happened within Seventh-day Adventism because in one way or another, all of us consider ourselves to be Seventh-day Adventists, don't we? 
Now, there was something very important that we brought out last week, and it really dealt with the fact that Jesus is currently where? Where do we find Christ? Aside from being right here behind me, He is inside the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And that's why we're going to have Jesus, or rather, that's why we're going to be with Jesus where He is. We ought to follow Him whithersoever He goeth, and we ought to be beholding the work that He's doing in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And we talked about that work and how that work was connected to the responsibility that was given to the high priest on the Day of Atonement, specifically the fact that Christ is there dealing with the sin problem, the putting away of sin. Now, if we can summarize what we discussed last week into two particular paragraphs and point something out, it would be really what we find in this one statement here in a great controversy because it really points out to what is going to be the culmination of things in these last days as it relates to God's people. In the Great Controversy on page 452, paragraph 1, we read, Those who are living upon the earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling, through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil, while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven. While the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away sin among God's people upon earth. Now, how many of us here today agree with this very statement? How many of us understand that there's a process that is taking place here on earth as well, not only the heavenly sanctuary. I'm hoping that most of us would lift up their hand and, and recognize that the gospel is calling us not only to a time or to a process of justification, the true gospel of the Bible leads us through the process of sanctification, and of course the culmination of everything would be glorification at sec of Jesus' second coming. But this is imperative for us as Christians living in the last days to understand. She puts it a little bit different in Christ's Object Lesson on page 69, paragraph 1. And there we read, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. What I would like us to do here today is give a little bit of a different thought process behind how we are going to get to this place. This is why the title is The LGT Problem. Now, this is not the LGTBQYZ problem. We're, we're talking about something else here. Uh, the acronym LGT stands for Last Generation Theology. There was a problem in the ideas within the last generation theology teaching. Now, perhaps some of you are familiar with this term, but I am venturing to guess that there are people who are unfamiliar with what last generation theology is, uh, where does it come from, what does it stand for. Now, I want to point out something very important now that we're looking at the title. Notice that it says problem singular. And it is a problem singular because I believe that a lot of the information provided within this framework or this thought process that is connected to the last generation theology is actually correct, fundamentally, biblically correct. But do you remember what, um, what I mentioned to you last week when we were discussing these things and the things that were taking place in the church? When Christ came the first time, there seemed to be different groups, primarily two major groups within the believers that were anticipating his first advent. They were called the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were constantly against each other. And one might say, well, you know what, at least the Pharisees were closer to Jesus because uh, they were the uh, more pious, so to speak, on the outside from the two groups of believers. You see, the Sadducees, they didn't even believe that there was such thing as a resurrection. 
It would have been better to be a Pharisee rather than a Sadducee because their way of thinking was perhaps a little bit better than that of the Sadducees. But what do we learn from history when we look at that particular event? What did Jesus tell the Jewish people? What did Jesus do? He told us, he gave us a lesson that uh, we ought to beware of both sides. We're not to be examining both sides to see which one is more right and which one is more wrong so that we can go to the side that's more right. No, that's not what Jesus called the disciples and the Jewish people to do. He did the exact opposite. He said, beware of both sides because there's something wrong. There's something wrong in the leaven of both sides. And I think the devil has used this tactic of putting people against each other continually, not only within church settings, but even if we go to the political sphere of things, notice how there's always perhaps two leading parties that are contending for the power in a country. That's why we have the, cons the conservatives and the liberals. Two parties that are constantly at odds with each other. Now, I'm not here to make any political statements, and I don't want anybody here to get offended that um, I, I, I am quoting Matthew 16 and applying this to conservatives and to liberals, because in one way or another, uh, truthfully speaking, in uh, the proper term of conservatism, I think God has called us all to be conservatives in one way or another. But I'm just looking at this as we behold the world, as we behold the Word of God, as we behold the things that take place in the church. The devil uses this tactic constantly to put two parties against each other in such a way that they begin to oppose each other so much that both of these parties fall in the ditch. It is a common tactic used by him. And I have experienced that and I have seen it in the world and in the church. Why am I mentioning this? Well, when we go back to the 1950s and to the printing out of questions on doctrine, um, there were actually a lot of individuals who were in opposition to uh, some of the ideas that were being put into this book. And even up until today, you would find many different messages discussing questions on doctrine and uh, books that have been written by various uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, pastors and, and theologians who are in opposition to questions on doctrine. And what do we see in the church? Well, we are left with two camps. We're either for the things that, that are uh, presented in questions on doctrine or we are against the things that are presented in questions on doctrine. And that's what Satan tries to do and always tries to push us into one of two camps. But what if both camps are wrong? What if, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, both camps failed to see the biggest picture? Now, how is all this connected with LGT or last generation theology? Well, there was a man back then by the name of M.L. Andreasen. And M.L. Andreasen was very unhappy, even upset at the fact that he was not allowed to be part of the conversations that took place in the mid-1950s between the evangelicals, Walter Martin, Barnhouse, and Adventist leadership. And he was very unhappy because M.L. Andreasen openly denounced a lot of the teachings that were found within uh, the way of thinking of uh, be it Leroy Froome or any of the other men who were of the same mindset. He strongly disagreed with the majority of the teachings. And I would like us to, however, examine one particular aspect of his ideas. In fact, M. L. Andreessen could, in general, be labeled as a person who is to be considered the forefather of last generation theology. The, the, the term last generation is actually borrowed from his book on the sanctuary, where in the very last pay, uh, chapter, chapter 21, he entitles the chapter, The Last Generation, and he goes through a thought process that we're going to examine today, because I believe that thought process would actually prevent us from accomplishing what we read earlier in those statements from the testimonies in Christ's object lesson. You see, Jesus wants us to embrace all of the truth. 
98% of Jesus is not 100% of Jesus. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. And we ought to have 100% of Jesus. So let's look at what the LGT problem is. Again, if you have considered Emma Andreessen as, as a great teacher who has helped you in your Christian walk, please follow me along with my thought process here. Because as I mentioned, um, everything even in the book that I just quoted from him, uh, the book on the sanctuary, the majority of ideas coming from uh, Brother Andreessen were biblically sound and correct. But there's always that little thing that changes something in the way we approach the gospel that I believe uh, ultimately becomes detrimental and prevents us from getting to the place where Jesus wants us to be. And if it didn't, one is to beg the question, well, why are we still here? Why hasn't last generation theology accomplished what it intends to accomplish? What, why have we been wandering in the wilderness for three times 40 years? Why hasn't Christ returned? And I believe it's because we ought to come to that 100% level and embrace Jesus. Now, I'm putting aside the fact that Emil Andreessen did not stand for the truth about God. We don't have much information on him and where he stood when the Trinity controversy was roaring into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but we know for a fact that he did not stand for the truth on that subject. He did not agitate that subject, and he did not make a public stand for that which was biblically correct. Other people did, but ML Andreas didn't. So we're leaving that side aside, because his focus was on other things that were in, <laughs> indeed biblically sound. But there's an issue, and we're going to examine that issue by allowing him to give us his thought process about what is taking place in the last days and, and uh, what, according to him, is important and should be understood by people. And then what we're going to do is transition into the testimonies and compare the two thought processes. And at the end of this, I pray that Jesus can be brought to the place where he ought to be so that we in turn can be brought to the place where we need to be. So we're going to go into that book, The Sanctuary Service, into chapter 21, and we're going to follow Emma Lindgeris' thought process. We're going to read through several paragraphs so that we can get the picture. And then we're going to compare this to the testimony. So here's what ML Andreessen says, and before we carry on, I am purposefully going through this just to for us to understand how important it is to be fishermen, the disciples of Christ. How important it is not to fall for this group or for that group, but to seek from Christ everything that He ought to show us. All the truth. We ought to be apostles. He's not calling us to be Pharisees or to be Sadducees. He's not calling us to be conservatives or to be liberals. He's calling us to the truth. And the truth needs to be preached in its fullest. And when the truth is preached in its fullest, only then are we going to be where Christ wants us to be so He can return and claim us as His own. So let's begin here with the things that He presents in the sanctuary service. He says, The final demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity is still in the future. Christ showed the way. He took a human body and in that body demonstrated the power of God. Men are to follow His example and prove that what God did in Christ, He can do in every human being who submits to Him. The world is awaiting this demonstration. When it has been accomplished, the end will come. God will have fulfilled His plan. He will have shown Himself true and Satan a liar. His government will will stand vindicated. Now, as we're reading through this, we might be thinking, well, isn't that what we just read in the Great Controversy? I, I don't see much of a difference here between what we just read in the Great Controversy and in Christ's object lesson to what this brother uh, mentions. Could there be something that we have uh, missed? This is from the testimonies. 
But I want to bring something out that is very important and to stimulate every single one of us to be diligent Bible students who are not just studying for the sake of acquiring knowledge, but studying as a Berean seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God so he can bring us to a complete understanding of the Bible. Everybody claims to believe in the Bible. You walk into any denomination today, they will lift up the Bible and they will tell you that they believe in the Bible. So what's the problem? How can that be? How can we all be using the same book, reading the same book, and yet come to different conclusions? Well, there's something lacking in our individual experience with Christ and our desire to truly seek the Holy Spirit for guidance. So here's the counsel that we've been warned about. It says, the track of truth lies close beside the track of error, and both tracks may seem to be one to minds which are not worked by the Holy Spirit, and which therefore are not quick to discern the difference between truth and error. We are to apply this to every theological, doctrinal controversy we encounter today. A deception is only a deception when it is so good that the regular person is not able to discern the difference between truth and error. The enemy will never give us an, an open error in our face. That will never happen. And there are so many controversies within Adventism, within those who believe the truth about God, you name it. There's so much controversy. The devil's at work. He's always been at work. He's been at work for 6,000 years. And we have been warned that the difference between truth and error will be so minute that the regular person who is not regularly allowing the Holy Spirit to work on their heart will not be able to discern between the two. So let's come back now and continue with reading from Adrian's book so we can learn more about the thought process that he gives as he continues to elaborate. Carrying on, he says, It is in the last generation of men living on the earth that God's power unto sanctification will stand fully revealed. The demonstration of that power is God's vindication. So that word you're going to see a lot, vindicate, vindication. Something has not been vindicated yet with respect to God, with respect to His character, with respect to His law. It hasn't happened yet. And that is yet to be something that happens at the end of time through that last generation that he's pointing to. He says, the demonstration of that power is God's vindication. It clears him of any and all charges which, which Satan has placed against him. In the last generation, God is vindicated and Satan defeated. You see, there's still a chance for God to be defeated because he has not been vindicated yet. He carries on the demonstration which God intends to make with the last generation on earth means much both to the people and to God. Can God's law really be kept? Yet, to produce a people that will keep the law is the task which God has set Himself and which He expects to accomplish. When the statement and challenge are issued by Satan, no one can keep the law, it is impossible. If there be any that can do it or that have done it, show them to me. Where are they that keep the commandments? God will quietly answer, Here are they. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It is that group of people at the end of time who will, in fact, demonstrate to the universe and to the world, according to what M. L. Andreessen is saying here, that the law of God can be kept. And until this becomes a reality, God is not going to be vindicated. His law is not going to be vindicated, neither, nor would his character. He goes on, When God commands man to keep his law, it does not serve the purpose he has in mind to have only a few men keep it, just enough to show it can be done. It is not in line with God's character to pick outstanding men of strong purpose and superb training and demonstrate through them what he can do. It is much more... If harmony, it is much more if harmony with his plan to make his requirements such that even the weakest need not fail. 
so that none can ever say that God demands that which can be done by only a few. It is for this reason that God has reserved his greatest demonstration for the last generation, the greatest demonstration of how the law can be kept. is going to be revealed only through this last generation. Page 113. In the last generation, God will stand vindicated. He hasn't been vindicated yet. His character has not been vindicated. His law has not been vindicated. That is yet to come through the manifestation of those in that last generation. In the remnant, Satan will meet his defeat. The charge that the law cannot be kept will be met and fully refuted. God will produce not only one or two who keep his commandments, but a whole group spoken of as the 144,000. They will reflect the image of God fully. They will have disproved Satan's accusations against the government of heaven. It is those men that are going to be defeating Satan and disproving Satan's accusations against the government of God. And now here comes the culmination of his thought process. In order for God to sustain his contention, it is necessary for him to show that he has not been arbitrary, that the law is not harsh and cruel in its requirement, but contrarywise, that it is holy, just, and good, and that man can keep it. It is necessary for God to produce at least one man who has kept the law. Think about this. It is necessary for God to produce at least one man who has kept the law. In the absence of such a man, God loses and Satan wins. The outcome, therefore, hinges on the production of one or more who keep the commandments of God. On this God has staked his government. Final thought by M.O. and Jensen. Through the last generation of saints, God stands finally vindicated through them, he defeats Satan and wins his case. God is depending upon us as he did upon Job. Is his confidence well placed? We're reading and going through this. We're thinking together. We're trying to understand. And perhaps you're thinking, well, isn't that true? Didn't we talk about that last week? Didn't we talk about that there's going to come a time when Michael will stand, as the book of Daniel tells us, when his mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, will cease. And isn't it true that there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was before, during which God's people are going to have to walk here on earth without a mediator in the heavenly courts, when the putting away of sin would have come to an end? It is true then what is the problem? Remember what we said? The path between truth and error will be so similar. But there's going to be always just a little bit, just as we use the illustration every time of rat poison. Rat poison is 96% ingredients that are food. It is the 3 to 4% of that block of rat poison that kills the animal and it ought to be so because otherwise the animal is not going to take it the path between truth and error is so similar but there's a mindset here that is contrary to what the gospel has presented there's a mindset here that puts Something on the shoulders of men that ought not to be there and that is going to in fact prevent men from coming to the place where they ought to be in preparation for the time of trouble such as never was before. And now we'll compare what we just read and I hope that we looked at the wording and, and what everything was pointing on this vindication of God's character coming and being put on the shoulders of men at the end of time called the last generation. I have personally been present of, at various camp meetings, at various presentations where proponents of the last generation theology have been there. 
And usually when this teaching is introduced, like I said, we are focusing on the problem. We're putting aside everything that is fundamentally correct. I don't want us to keep our mind on the things that are fundamentally correct. I want us to be thinking here with this one particular issue because it is one issue that is going to separate us from Jesus. But coming back to the, uh, to the experience that I was sharing, I've been present at different presentations and usually this idea of the last generation theology is not always, but a lot of the time connected with the urgency of time and the end of time coming. I was listening to a brother and he was using uh, the illustration of the Big Ben, the clock. And he was presenting this idea of how God is trying to bring us to where we ought to be and how he's waiting for us. And also he was connecting that with time and pointing to the fact that time is running out. And Satan, and Satan knows. Satan knows that if he can delay us a little bit longer, if he can just keep us focused on the world, time will run out and the great controversy will be lost and Satan will be victorious because God would not have been able to bring out the last generation and fulfill and prove Satan a liar. There was always this connection with time, putting extra pressure on the listener to embrace and to believe what was being presented. Well, I want us to go through the testimonies now, and I, I pray that we can not put aside the fundamental truth that we read in Great Controversy and Christ's Object Lesson, but put it in its light and bring, I pray that all of us will be brought that much closer to Jesus as a result of this. The first statement we're going to see is from Signs of the Times, January 16th, 1907. And it says there, in order to save fallen man under a sense of the infinite magnitude of the task, Christ undertook to represent to the world the character of God and his great love for the world. My father had so loved you that he even loves me more for giving my life to redeem you in becoming your substitute and surety by surrendering my life by taking your liabilities, your transgressions, I am endeared to my Father. For by my sacrifice, His will is fulfilled. His law vindicated. And God can be just and yet justify him who believes in Jesus. This is focusing on the sacrifice, but there's more to it. And I want us to be comparing the language used in these statements to the language that was used in the statements we just read. It, it was impossible for the sinner to keep the law of God, which was holy, just, and good. But this impossibility was removed by the impartation of the righteousness of Christ to the repenting, believing soul. Do we understand what that means? If Christ hadn't come, if he hadn't lived as one of us, if he hadn't experienced the things that you ex experience, if he, haven't, if he hadn't conquered Satan, if he hadn't lived a life that was void of sin from start to finish, no human being would have ever been able to be an overcomer, an impossibility. She continues, the life and death of Christ in behalf of sinful men were for the purpose of restoring the sinner to God's favor through imparting to him the righteousness that would meet the claims of the law and find acceptance with the Father. But is ever the purpose of Satan to make void the law of God and to pervert the true meaning of the plan of salvation. Therefore, he has originated the falsehood that the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary's cross was for the purpose of freeing man from the obligation of keeping the commandments of God. Here's the other camp. There's no such thing as overcoming sin. Christ already did it and we can continue our life and not worry about what we produce. The two sides that are always against each other, pushing against each other. There are so many people who, um, so many Seventh-day Adventist people who have tried many different things to fit into a conservative camp, but they come to the point of where they can't take it anymore and they go to what? To the other extreme. And that's what the enemy wants. And that's why he always puts something on every side in order to confuse us and prevent us 
from coming to the point of where Christ wants us to be. He did it with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees at Christ's first advent, and He's going to ever continue to put and push people to the extreme so that both sides can fall into the ditch. Coming back to the statement, she says, He has foisted upon the world the deception that God has abolished His constitution, thrown away His moral standard, and made void His holy and perfect law. Had He done this, at what terrible expense would it have been to heaven? Instead of proclaiming the abolition of the law, Calvary's cross proclaims it, thunder tones its immutable and eternal character. Could the law have been abolished and the government of heaven and earth and the unnumbered worlds of God maintained, Christ need not have died. The death of Christ was to forever settle. The death of Christ was to forever settle the question of the validity of the law of Jehovah. Having suffered the full penalty for a guilty world, Jesus became the mediator between God and man to restore the repenting soul to favor with God by giving him grace to keep the law of the Most High. Christ came not to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them to the very letter. The atonement of Calvary vindicated the law of God as holy, just, and true, not only before the fallen world, but before heaven and before worlds unfallen. Christ came to magnify the law and to make it honorable. What did Christ accomplish by His righteous life and death on the cross? He vindicated the law of God, the law of Jehovah, forever. Not only for everyone down here on earth, but for all of the unfallen worlds. They understood at that point the character of God and the immutability of His law because of the life that He lived, because He condescended and came down here to be from among the lowest of the low, because He lived a righteous life and overcame the enemy, and because He gave His life a ransom for men. Youth Instructor, February 11, 1897. Jesus Christ counted it not a thing to be grasped to be equal with God because divinity, divinity alone could be efficacious in the res restoration of man from the poisonous bruise of the serpent God himself in his only begotten son assumed human nature and in the weakness of human nature notice this so up until now we, we looked at all these statements where she was talking about the fact that it was the death on Calvary that had this vindicative aspect to the holy law of God and to God's character. But now here she's bringing out the fact that because Christ came down on earth, because he put on human nature, because he lived a life of no sin from start to finish, as the Bible says, there was no sin found in him, the law of God could be vindicated in every particular and accepted the sentence of wrath and death for the sons of man. The law of God was vindicated by the life that Christ lived here on earth in every particular. Do you know why it was vindicated in every particular? The law demands perfect righteousness. We the time of trouble such as never was before is going to last about a year. From the time of Michael stands up to the time of his second coming down on earth, the outpouring of the seven last plagues, that period is about one year. That is the period through which God's people walk on earth during this time that we've never seen before without a mediator in the heavenly courts. Do you think that one year of righteous life can vindicate the law of God in every particular? What about the rest of the life of that person? You see, the law demands perfect obedience and righteousness. What does the Bible tell us about you and I, 
about every person that has ever lived on this earth. According to Romans 3, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no way any one of us can in any way vindicate the law of God by being righteous for one year. It is an impossibility. It diminishes the requirements of the law. That thought process diminishes the requirements of the law. It was Jesus and His life as a man, as a fallen man, even if it were the case, even if there were uh, more than 144,000 of us who can point to our lives and, and our lives could have been perfect from the earliest moments all the way until our death. Do you remember what one of the previous statements said? The only way that could have been accomplished to begin with was again because of the life that Christ came and lived on earth. He makes it a possibility for you and I to attain to righteousness. It was what He did with His life here on earth and with His sacrifice on Calvary that vindicated the law of God in every particular. No man will ever do that. The life of Christ was a most perfect and thorough vindication of His Father's law, and His death attested its immutability. Christ did not, by bearing the sinner's guilt, release man from his obligation to obey the law, for if the law could have been changed or abolished, he need not have come to this world to suffer and die. The very fact that Christ died for its transgressions attests the unchanging character of the Father's law. This is what we see, and this is not just a, uh, an opinion of a writer from the 1800s. This is the concept of the plan of salvation. This is what the Bible presents to us with respect to the mission of Jesus Christ. Remember, Two messages ago, we talked about Romans chapter 5, and we talked about the, fa the fact that we are saved by His life and reconciled to God by His death. It is the life of Christ, both the life that He lived here to satisfy the demands of the law, and that very life that He then in turn gives to you and me. It is the life of Christ that vindicated His Father's law in every particular, and not the life of man. You see, brothers and sisters, there's a very important concept in the Bible. And that concept deals with something that was mentioned in the Sabbath School uh, Quarterly this morning and something that we ever have to keep before our eyes. Now, are we to throw away everything else that stands in connection with what is going to be taking place at the end of time? Of course not. Is God waiting to see a people who have His character in them? so that He can come and claim them as their own? Absolutely. But we need a mindset that will take us there. And we need to make sure we get rid of anything that in any shape or form might separate us from becoming who Christ wants us to be. He is ever to be before our minds. He is ever to be lifted up. It is by beholding that we become change. You see, in the first example, connected to the teachings of the last generation theology, man was being lifted up. In the, test, in the statements that we just read, we saw something different. This is what God wants from us. And this is why the Bible says that He must increase and we must decrease. Christ must increase and the last generation must decrease. We are to ever put Christ where He belongs and fully understand what He has done for us. And any contrary mindset would actually, regardless of the fact that He's trying to take us to a place where we need to be, will not help us in our spiritual it is Jesus. It is lifting Him up. It is falling in love with Him. It is recognizing to the fullest what He has done for me, 
for the fallen human race, it is recognizing that it was the life of Christ that vindicated the law of God. And when we take hold of that, and when we make it a reality in our everyday experience, when we get into the habit of lifting Him up and decreasing ourselves in our individual lives, in the things that we teach and preach, only then are we going to be brought to the position of having been ready to be taken from this miserable world. So, brothers and sisters, I just want to ask, how many of us here today want to have Him increase and us decrease? How many of us here today realize that it is Christ who ought to be increased and men ought to be decreased. It is Christ that ought to be increased and the last generation decreased in light of the things that we have shared, of course. Praise the Lord. We're going to have our closing hymn and then we're going to come back and uh, close with a word of prayer. Let us uh, kneel and close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for what you have done for us. We're so thankful that we have been given the opportunity to live on this earth and receive grace from on high. Father, we need you every day, moment by moment. We need to behold what Christ has done. He is the truth, the way, and the life. It is by our individual experience with Christ and relying on Him and recognizing Him as the author and finisher of our faith that we're going to be able to be brought to the place where you can take us through the time such as never was before. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful that your son came here and that he lived a righteous life, that he overcame the temptations of Satan, that there was no sin found in him so that your law can be vindicated, so that the universe can understand more about your character of love and the immutability of your holy law. Father, I pray that we take hold of this and I pray that we make it a personal experience. I pray that we learn this lesson of putting Christ in its place, of lifting Him up higher and higher as the testimonies say. And only then are we going to be able to be transformed into His image. By beholding, we become changed. And I pray that this can be a daily experience for every single one of us that is here today. I want to pray for every person and every, every family that is represented. Father, give us the wisdom that we need from on high. May your Holy Spirit continue to guide us, not just in understanding and knowledge, but also in transformation and sanctification. We thank you, Father, and we pray and ask all of this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.